All right, yeah, so um, can you guys hear me? I'm guessing it's good. Um, so yeah, I'm Jarrett. Uh, I work with the Julia Group at MIT. Um, I kind of wear a couple different hats from day to day, but today I'm wearing my forward diff maintainer hat. Um, so forward diff, as Miles talked about, is a forward mode automatic differentiation library written in Julia. Uh, and the purpose of the package is kind of in the subtitle uh, for the talk. So I, I really like to make it uh, easy for people to efficiently take derivatives of Julia code without having to know uh, too much. So we'll see if we get the fast and the easy part uh, by the end of this. Um, so I'm going to be uh, starting off discussing a little bit of the theory um, and maybe presenting some alternative methods for taking uh, derivatives and explaining why those are not the methods you should use. Um, I'll explain a little bit about uh, the methods that drives forward diff, and then I'll talk about the implementation um, of those methods in Julia. Uh, I'll benchmark versus autograd, which is a popular reverse mode implementation um, in Python uh, that relies on, on NumPy. Um, and I will also talk about some pitfalls that I've seen users run into when using forward diff. Um, they're mainly pretty easy to avoid. There's one really tricky, subtle thing um, that most people don't know about, uh, which I'm kind of excited to, to show and talk about. So uh, finally, I'll, I'll talk about like the directions that I would like to take the package uh, in the future. So we kind of start off uh, with an example. Uh, let's say uh, your coworker gave you some code, or maybe you wrote code uh, like a couple months ago, and you can't even read it. It's like really ugly. Uh, you, maybe you didn't write it. Maybe your coworker gave it to you. Um, but you do know it's a function, and it's uh, it's an implementation of a function. Uh, it's a scalar function, and it's probably differentiable. And so you want to take the derivative. How how would you do it? Well, so you might say, Jared, I, I know calculus. There's a limit definition of a derivative, and I can, I can utilize this maybe to, to take an approximation. So that would be a pretty common, um, a common idea, uh, and maybe even a common mistake. Um, but so uh, on the right-hand side there in the green box uh, is the central difference uh, method. Uh, so what you do is essentially vary the input back and forth um, by some small step size h, uh, and then take the difference and use that over the area of variation to approximate um, the derivative. So this guy uh, has a couple of interesting properties. Uh, so he, he has a truncation error term on the order of uh, the square of the step size. Uh, and so you might say, well, if I make my step size really small, that guy will go away. And you're right, he will go away. But then your approximation becomes meaningless uh, because uh, you're, not, you're no longer varying uh, heavily enough to, to actually um, detect any change, and, and you'll just be evaluating f of x minus f of x, and so that will be quite bad. Um, so you're always going to have some approximation error with, with, with this method, um, and it does require two evaluations of the original target function, which you, you know, may, maybe you're okay with that, um, but maybe you're more greedy and, and, and don't want to do this. Um, the huge advantage of this method is that uh, if your function works at all, then this method probably will work to differentiate it. Um, you just have to evaluate the function, basically, uh, a couple of times, and, and you, you get an answer. Um, other methods, are, which we'll see, are a little bit more complicated. So uh, this method is a actually pretty popular one um, right now. Uh, and what it involves is essentially appending our step size, our little perturbation, uh, to uh, an imaginary unit and then passing that through the function. And so you'll see I've written out the Taylor series expansion to a couple of terms here. Uh, and what, you, what, what pops out of this guy uh, are a couple of derivatives and then um, you kind of just incorporate the higher order terms here into, into uh, an error term. And so uh, this method is actually kind of nice because you don't need two calls to f. Uh, there's no subtractive cancellation error, so you can make h as small as you want um, without uh, losing, losing the, the power of your approximation. Um, so you, you basically can, can make it small enough to where your, uh, your error there is, is going to be uh, machine epsilon. Um, a lot of languages support complex numbers, so, so that's good. So this method gets a lot of use in MATLAB for that reason. Um, there are some downsides. So 
if you have, for, for example, a lot of programs are written in such a way that even if the user was only thinking about uh, differentiating them from the reals to the reals, um, maybe the functions that compose uh, the, the outer program uh, actually do incorporate some semantic meaning when uh, fed complex numbers. So, uh, for example, a, a, a complex conjugate transpose versus just a normal transpose. If you complex conjugate transpose an array of reals, it's just still real, and so you may not even notice that you actually did a complex conjugate transpose, but if there happen to be complex numbers in there, that semantically means something. Uh, and so passing in a complex number in this case will change the semantics of the program perhaps, uh, and that is of course bad because then you're not taking the derivative that you actually want to take. Um, so it's also the case that, that operations on complex numbers can be a bit slower depending on the functions. Um, than operations over the reals, and that, that can um, actually be significant to the point that uh, finite differencing uh, is actually the faster method, even though you're doing a whole other uh, function evaluation. Uh, so this method generally does require either operator overloading or source code transformation because of the fact that uh, most programs incorporate uh, maybe some form of branching, for example, uh, where it assume, may, may assume like an order on the, on the input, which complex numbers are unordered in most implementations, uh, will either error out or like not do the right thing if you try to do this type of uh, comparator. So you need to somehow modify the original program uh, so, that, that, uh, so that that will work. So if you were really bored and you were like, ah, I'm going to look up even fancier ways to take derivatives today, you might hit upon this method. Uh, so this is pretty similar to the complex number method, um, but dual numbers are a little bit of a different animal. So uh, they're kind of like complex numbers in that you just have a real component and you have some appended element to the reals. But in this case, the element you're appending is different. So instead of having it be defined as the element squared is negative one, uh, we define it as the element squared is zero, but the element is not zero. So it's best thought of, I would say, as like a infinitesimal perturbation um, of, the, of the thing you're, you're, you're appending it to. Um, and this definition is really convenient because when you evaluate the Taylor series, uh, the higher order terms past the first order derivative term uh, just, just fall away because of the, because of the zeros. And so I guess this gives us a way to uh, take exact derivatives of, of, of our target function with no approximation error. Um, but it does require a whole new number type. Uh, and so that's usually the huge barrier to implementing this kind of method is that uh, it's really annoying uh, to most people to implement these number types. L luckily, uh, it wasn't annoying to me, and so I implemented it for all of Julia to use. Um, and so I, uh, I have this plot here. So this is a pretty common plot. If you, uh, if you research this stuff at all, you'll see these kinds of plots everywhere. It's mostly interesting. Um, because of the finite difference curve. So what this is showing is um, as we vary the, the step size, this h, what happens to our error um, uh, for these different methods? So the, the blue dotted line up here is the, is the central finite difference. Uh, and you see that uh, it, will, it will go down, the truncation error will, will go down up to a point, and then it, it will become negligible compared to the subtractive cancellation error. Uh, and then it starts to raise up to the point where your approximation becomes meaningless. The complex step method follows the same uh, order uh, uh, that, that O of H squared term at the end. It follows that same uh, line down until it hits machine epsilon and then just flattens out there because you can't really have uh, uh, error better, better than or smaller than that. So uh, I plotted the dual number line on here as well, even though it's not really meaningful to vary the step size because there's no dependence on it. Uh, so it's just a flat line at uh, machine epsilon. So I also, so that, that plot was actually generated using this function here on the left. Um, and so this function, uh, like the plot, is also kind of a common function for people to compare to. I, I guess it's just nice because it's got some uh, exponentiation, it's got some arithmetic, it's got some trig functions. So it's, it's got a little bit of everything. And you probably wouldn't feel, if you saw this, you'd probably be like, ah, I don't want to write out the derivative of, of this. So, um, so it's kind of a good use case. Uh, so what we see here is a, an example of what I was talking about earlier, where the complex step method, even though you're only taking one function evaluation compared to two, uh, 
is actually slower than the finite differencing method uh, because of the fact that complex number operations on, on these uh, specific component functions are just going to be so much slower. Uh, the dual number implementation I used was for diffs dual number implementation. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's quite fast. So hopefully, I've kind of convinced you that dual numbers, if you're just taking scalar derivatives, like this kind of thing is the way to go. Probably shouldn't, if you, if you have it available to you, which hopefully you, you, you do since you all use Julia, um, that, that you should use that instead of these other methods for that kind of thing. But so it's also kind of boring though, right? That, those are like scalar derivatives. Like nobody does this in practice. Uh, most people have, you know, really high input dimensions. And so they, they want to take gradients and Jacobians and, and these types of things. Uh, and so we kind of want to extend the advantages that dual numbers gives us to, to these problems. And so how do we do that? Well, we can write out the gradient pretty simply enough to taking a partial derivative along each of the input dimensions. Um, and so that's, that's fine. And so all of these are partial derivatives, the output scalars. We kind of know how to take normal scalar derivatives. So the question is, like, can we combine these two ideas? And I mean, of course, the answer is yes. If it, if it wasn't yes, I probably wouldn't be talking. Um, but so, so, so what, you, uh, what you have to do here to, to combine these two ideas is you just append the perturbation along the input dimension that you wish to take the partial derivative of. So uh, what you do is you do this, and then you, you, send it, you send it on through the function. And then what pops out is the partial derivative along the input dimension that you seeded with the perturbation. Um, so this is, this is pretty cool. We can now use this method and then kind of like finite differencing or complex step. We can go through and call g n times and then get n derivatives out. Um, but it's kind of, well, do we really need to do that? I mean, it's, we almost engineered this definition of dual numbers just so that we could get better derivatives. Why can't we engineer them so that we can get more derivatives? So we can. Um, so we can extend the dual numbers uh, to include extra epsilon components, essentially. Um, so what we do here is this is the original uh, dual number definition at the top. Uh, and then what we're doing is we are essentially appending uh, uh, a bunch more orthogonal perturbations uh, that don't mix with each other. And these guys can be used to seed uh, your input vector along every dimension simultaneously. Uh, so, yeah, and so then you can pass this into your function, and what you'll get out is the partial derivative along every uh, dimension, which is what we wanted, which is our, our gradient. Um, so that's pretty cool. I will say in practice, it's quite a large memory cost to actually have all of these perturbations running through at once. And it's not really the most effective use of memory bandwidth. And so in reality, you kind of do this in-between uh, tuning game where you uh, use only a couple epsilon components, but then you can take a couple derivatives at a time. And then you partition uh, the directional derivatives up into chunks uh, and then uh, evaluate the gradient that way. Also, I also talked about Jacobians. Uh, it's mainly the same thing. The only thing that really changes uh, from the uh, derivative perspective is that the, the output dimension has increased. Um, so, but the input dimension uh, is, is still kind of, you play the same game. You seed these guys with uh, the, the perturbations, and then uh, what pops out are the uh, directional derivatives that, that fill out the rows of the Jacobian. So that's kind of the hand wavy theory behind all of this. Um, but now let's, let's look at the actual Julia code, or at least a small, tiny subset of it. Uh, so the first kind of building block we run into um, when implementing our like dual number in Julia is we, we need some container to store the partial derivatives in. Uh, so what we use in forward diff is essentially uh, a wraparound of an in-tuple. Um, and it's basically a fixed size vector. Um, if you've ever used uh, Simon's fixed size vector package, it shares a lot of similarity with, with that. It's got uh, things like addition and scaling defined on it, as you might expect. Um, and then we wrap that in our actual dual number type. And so the value here is just the real component of the dual number, while the partials are, um, actually, if we just go back, the partials are, are, these, are these y's right here. 
So these guys are the things that allow us to configure how we're seeding the, the epsilon components throughout the input, the vec uh, input vector. So go back. So you'll notice that I subtyped this to real, um, which was kind of a, a controversial decision originally um, because you know, dual numbers are not uh, mathematically a subset of the real numbers. And so uh, it was kind of upsetting to make this subtype relation. But programmatically, what we really want to do is we really want to be able to drop dual numbers into a program wherever real numbers would feel comfortable being. And so for that reason, we need to make sure that we obey the real interface, um, Julia, Julia's uh, base real interface, uh, in a way that doesn't change the semantics of the program that we're working with, other than accumulating derivative information. So to do that, I, I, to give an example of like, uh, of a function where uh, we don't allow the partials to interfere with the behavior, uh, I've, I've overloaded the comparator is less. Um, so it's just like the less than symbol, Julia. And so, uh, so this allows uh, dual numbers to propagate uh, through branches of a program without, uh, without interfering with, with how the program would branch normally. Um, there's also uh, a huge number of like random uh, number functions that have to be overloaded to properly support dual numbers. Um, these are just some examples. So sign is fairly straightforward. It's the univariate function. You just apply sign to the, to the value, and then you take its derivative and propagate it to the partial components. It's um, basically, if you want justification for why I'm doing that multiplication, that's the chain rule. I'm just propagating derivative information uh, along the, the, the path of the program. Uh, so there's also uh, this multiplication definition, uh, which is slightly more complicated. It's a bivariate function. It's not just a, a single single argument anymore, but it's also pretty easy. Uh, the, the derivative part of this essentially becomes uh, the product rule. Right? So there are a lot of these kind of things defined. Um, and it's, it's nice. We used to have like three different number types, all for taking like different order derivatives, but we got rid of those because you can actually, if you see this actually allows you to nest duals inside of duals, and that allows you to go to higher order derivatives. I would love to talk about that, but I'm not going to have time. Um, but what I will have time to do, and what I would like to show you, is an actual example of how like, you might do this manually if you had the dual number type. Um, so uh, I wrote up uh, an implementation, like a really naive implementation of the comprod function. It's the same semantically as uh, Julia's base implementation. I have no idea whether it's actually close to what Julia uses in base, because uh, I, I just wrote it up pretty quickly. Um, but, uh, but so there's the, the math definition of, of this guy over here. But it's, it, it's kind of a nice test function to differentiate, because it's got an if statement. It's got some loops. It mutates a vector. Like, like if you didn't believe automatic differentiation worked, like this might help you like, be like, OK, maybe, maybe this is a thing that's real. Um, so, uh, so we start out with our definition. Probably the first thing we should do is uh, actually write out the Jacobian. So I just do this for, th for, uh, for a three-element vector because it's, it's easy. And we'll evaluate it at some simple input value, one, two, one, two three. Um, so using, uh, forward diff, using forward diff's uh, dual number type, uh, we can essentially do this, this seeding of the input vector that I was talking about earlier. So we have the, the values here and then the epsilon components here. And so you notice that there are three epsilon components for each of these dual numbers, but I've zeroed out uh, the ones that I'm not interested in for each input dimension. Um, and so I have uh, this notation over here kind of explains that. Um, and so then it's pretty much as simple as passing this guy through, uh, through our function of interest, and the Jacobian just pops out. It's pretty, uh, pretty magical stuff. Um, you, in practice, like you, you wouldn't have to do all of this uh, jazz. It can get pretty complicated uh, if you're trying to uh, chunk up the uh, input dimension, like I was talking about earlier. So, uh, forward diff handles all of that for you, and we have a bunch of API functions that you can uh, read up on that are pretty pretty simple to use. Um, yeah. So, so I said it would be easy. I don't know whether I convinced anybody that 
It's easy, before it makes it easy, but does it make it fast? That's the question. That's the thing I have to, I have to answer for now. Um, and so I, I would like to say that it does because, uh, as, as Miles mentioned, uh, reverse mode is hands down an algorithmically more efficient method for taking a gradient than forward mode is going to be. Uh, and so Autograd is a fairly popular uh, Python library for, for doing reverse mode uh, AD, and it uh, basically only focuses, ma it focuses mainly on, on uh, differentiating functions which are composed of like NumPy methods, because that's like the common thing to, to, to use to have fast uh, computation in, in Python. Um, but so we're going to see how forward diff is maybe uh, a little bit faster for some, for some use cases. Um, so my first uh, kind of test function is uh, a popular function in, in optimization um, to, to, I think, check out gradient descent implementations or something like this. Um, it's the Rosenbrock function. And so what we kind of see is that for smaller input dimensions um, up to around the order of like 100,000, uh, for diff is actually quite a bit faster than autograd. And what's interesting, what I like about these tables is that you can kind of see the algorithmic scaling of each one. Um, so autograd has, uh, so this is a, a, a function that's linear in the input. Um, and like Miles said earlier, reverse mode is uh, constant in the uh, number of calls to the function it has to make to evaluate the gradient. So you see that there's a linear, uh, a linear increase as the, as the size increases here. Uh, and forward mode uh, has to, theoretically, uh, ha it could be bounded to uh, evaluate the function in the, the same number of times as the input dimension. It's a little bit better in forward diff because of that chunk mode kind of game we play. Um, but it, it's still like, you can still kind of see it. There's a, a quadratic scaling here a little bit. Um, so. The next, uh, the next test function I, I explored is a little bit more complicated and has some trig functions in there, which is nice. Um, and this guy also kind of has the same performance characteristics up until you hit um, something close, a bit closer to the 10,000 range here. But after you get into this, before you get into this region, forward diff is like the way to go. So it, it is worth noting also that um, Maybe, you know, Julia is also much faster than Python is <laughs> generally. But a lot of the time, I would hope, would be spent in, because I, I wrote the Python versions of these methods that I wrote, you can, you can find these in, in the forward diff repository. The, Py, the Python versions of these methods are uh, using vectorized NumPy functions, and the uh, code that gets generated by the reverse mode is also using vectorized functions. Um, but there might still be some conflation between, like, is it, Am I comparing four different autograd, or am I comparing NumPy and Julia? Uh, so a good idea would be to normalize the times of both of these against the original function implementations in each language. I didn't have enough time to do that, unfortunately. Um, but so now, now we're going to talk about uh, the pitfalls that I mentioned earlier um, at the beginning of the talk. So basically, there are a couple of uh, restrictions on your on your code if you want to be able to differentiate it using four diff, but they're pretty easy to look out for. So the first one is um, it has to be composed of generic Julia code. Uh, unfortunately, we can't inject uh, ju the, the Julia dual number type into some random C library. Um, if you're like calling out to uh, LaPack or something, we, we're not going to be able to uh, propagate derivative information through it. Um, and so we can't differentiate it. You'll get an error. Uh, on, on, this, on a similar note, uh, your function, uh, even if it is generic Julia code, has to actually be generic and accept uh, real number types or arrays of reals or what have you. Um, this is, once again, also pretty easy to watch out for. Uh, usually in Julia, you really shouldn't be restricting your uh, argument types unless you are using dispatch explicitly anyway. Um, but I have had users run into this. Um, and the final one isn't a real restriction. If your function isn't type stable, differentiation will work, but it'll be really slow. Also, your function will be really slow. So, like, don't do it. Like, it would be, it'd just be a very sad, sad thing if you used Julia and it was extremely slow. Um, so, the next bug, so that's, that, that's all you really have to worry about when writing your code, except for this, like, one subtle and extremely scary thing. 
uh, for me as a developer, um, which is perturbation confusion. And so this is kind of a weird thing to explain. We'll see if I don't run out of time trying to explain it. Um, so let, I'm using kind of a pseudocode here, but it looks kind of like Julia. So you have, uh, you have this differentiation operator, and then we have this like problem case maybe, like somebody might try to differentiate this code. So what this is is it's an outer function, which we're differentiating at one, and then inside of it, there is a closure that closes over some state that's local to the outer function, and that thing in and of itself is being differentiated. So this one out outside is being differentiated at x, this one inside is being differentiated at y. So if we, I mean, th these are actually fairly simple functions, uh, and if we can kind of manually do this calculation, uh, and if you do it, uh, you'll, you'll get one out. Um, so that is not what forward diff gives you, though. It gives you two. It's like uh, off by one error, but it's, it's not, it's not a, a very good one. Um, so the, th this problem is known as perturbation confusion and is well known in the AD community, um, but was not known to me when I originally uh, refactored and, and started working on forward diff. Uh, but so what essentially is happening here is that as these guys have perturbations injected into them to track derivative information, some of the perturbations from the outer scope leak into the differentiation operations inner scope. And so really what you want is for this epsilon component to track this operation, whereas you want this epsilon component to track this operation, or sorry, this one to track this one. Uh, but what you get is you get uh, this, this leakage where the perturbations erroneously mix and you know, how they mix depends on the function, but um, you, you basically end up getting um, this, this error. And so the way to solve this is by either having some way to identify that they shouldn't mix, so like a tagging system, or by somehow intercepting the perturbations um, at runtime or compile time generating code which tells you that you're, it's gonna be wrong, right? The dangerous thing about this is that it's a silent failure. Now, I, when, once I realized that forward diff was susceptible to this, I like looked uh, on GitHub and kind of did an exhaustive search. I couldn't find any code which actually ran into this. So nested differentiation is fine. It's the case where you are really doing a differentiation so, uh, uh, operation. You're doing nested differentiation where, one, uh, where there's a closed over epsilon component that, well, it's very subtle. Um, but I, I couldn't find it in the, in the wild, at least. So hopefully it's not too common that somebody would run into it. But so future work, the first thing, first order of uh, business would be to, to fix that bug somehow. Um, with the closure rewrite that happened a while back, uh, we, me and Miles have been playing with the idea of being able to inspect the types of the closed over variables and, um, via looking at the function type that gets generated for the closure and then somehow either triggering an error or if we can, like stripping the erroneous perturbations from the uh, closure. And that, that, would be, that would be really cool. Alternatively, we could implement a tagging system, but I've struggled with that in the past. It's hard to do, do it in a JIT compiled language uh, in a way that doesn't incur a runtime check. Um, at least it has been for me. Um, we'd also like to work on SIMD uh, operations for the partials type. Like I said, it's, it's basically a fixed size vector. There's a lot of people that are interested in having SIMD operations work on fixed size vectors in Julia. Um, there's work that's being done in base and in external packages for that to happen, and it would be a huge win for us um, since mainly what we're doing is we're just multiplying a scalar by the, these guys. Um, we can also solve this whole idea of not being able to uh, differentiate uh, external operations by making it really easy to um, to overload uh, the functions that uh, that wrap those external libraries, and so uh, it would be nice if, by default, for diff, for example, wrapped LaPack and and wrapped some like matrix factorizations such that uh, the derivative worked, even though it couldn't propagate the uh, the dual number all the way through. And so this is the kind of thing that uh, other other libraries and other languages uh, also do. So this is like a known thing. 
The final thing is I would love to work on reverse mode AD of native Julia code, which is uh, a, apparently a difficult topic, uh, topic to work on, um, and, but I've seen all the cool stuff that Miles does with reverse mode and jump, and it, it seems like an appealing uh, way forward uh, just to learn more about AD in general. Um, so I have some resources. This presentation, you can, if you, if you go to my GitHub, uh, it's, I have it in a repo, all the uh, random code and, and little text snippets that I use to generate the presentation are in there. Um, that's mainly probably the best way to go and find these resources to go there and look at these links. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people who pay me money. They're pretty important to me. Um, so the Julia group, along with, uh, in collaboration with Stephen Johnson and the Nano Soldier Grant, uh, have funded me to work on this, <coughs> among other things. Uh, I'd also like to thank Miles and Theodore Papamarco um, for, for uh, helping me out with learning this stuff originally last summer. And contributors to Forward Diff are always welcome and important, um, and they make the package much, much better. Uh, and I'd like to thank the JulieCon sponsors uh, and organizers, and that's it. So it, uh, it depends on what you're doing, but I, I, would, I would say that generally, yeah, you can assume that it will. Um, like I said, there's a trade-off to be made between how many perturbations you want to track at once. In that case, uh, I believe the, the, uh, the cost will be this, uh, on the order of the square of the input dimension. But um, in reality, you use much less than that to make better use of memory bandwidth, so, so yes. Yeah, it does. Uh, and then I think David had a question. Uh, Matt, also just on the number of perturbations, um, have you found a sweet spot? Is, 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 have you struck out the number like, of the training perturbations? It's 10. Literally, yes. No, I, I, I don't. So we're all, we are using tuples, right? So the, if we. Uh, if we have too many, we'll like just thrash, uh, thrash the stack, and that's not good. But I found that there's really no benefit to going above 10 usually. It almost always gets slightly slower. Um, and right now, after the latest release, you can't go above 10 uh, because I got rid of all the generated functions that were in the package. And to do that, I had to limit the chunk size that was available. So is there any other questions? So I, I'm not, I, I don't actually know, but it would be really nice. So there are a lot, of, a lot of simple operations on the partial types that are used to propagate the derivatives are theoretically like poster children for like SIMD. Um, but we haven't really got, gotten it to vectorize well yet. So it's still kind of an experimental phase. The man sitting right behind you actually, um, uh, Christopher Carlson has done a lot of cool work with trying to get the partials type to vectorize. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Oh, yeah. True. So, yeah, yeah, well, so, so, yeah, or even, even, yeah, so even more generally, just like, if your code maybe is an approximation of a system, this is along these same lines, I guess, if your code is an approximation of a system, if you take an exact derivative of an approximation, that might not be the derivative you want. Uh, so it is something to watch out for. That's a good, good catch. <laughs>